Okay, welcome to the Georgetown Wargaming Society uh, talk tonight. Uh, I'm Ed McGrady, and I'm going to be talking about gaming climate change. And in particular, what I want to do is talk about some of the challenges designers should think about when they're doing uh, climate change games. Uh, and so it's kind of like, hey, here are some tips and tricks. Here are some issues that you might face dealing with climate change games. And I'm going to be speaking both as a game designer, as well as someone who has to manage this stuff, uh, because there's some management, in, uh, more than one management issue associated climate, with climate change. Okay, so who am I and why do you care? Uh, I've done more than one game. Uh, I teach gaming uh, through the Virginia Tech Moore's uh, certificate classes. Uh, I have also, I'm now the editor of the Moore's Wargaming Journal or Moore's Journal of Wargaming. I got to get my journal name right. Uh, and I do a bunch of other stuff. So, and I'm also a, a adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, where I do games every now and then. Uh, so I do a lot of stuff uh, and I've done a lot more stuff. Um, I've done more than one climate change game. Uh, so I have some experience in this area. Uh, I've done more than one game that's on climate adjacent topics. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by climate adjacent, uh, but I've done some games on that. Uh, and so a lot of my opinions and insights on these games have come from what I would call bitter, bitter experience. Um, so what do I want to accomplish here? I'm going to talk about some of the issues, as I said, you have to deal with the designer when you confront climate change games. Note that I'm only talking here about what I call professional games. That's games played by people who are professionals, who have some uh, even remote vested stake in the particular area or topic that you're gaming. Uh, so these are games, serious games for people that have serious missions. I'm not talking about hobby games, board games, uh, or educational games. And I understand that there's a tremendous uh, space in the educational community for these sorts of games. Uh, they're gonna be a little bit different than what I'm talking about. Uh, and not a lot of the uh, principles that I'm talking about will apply directly to educational games. Uh, and certainly hobby and board games, you're kind of on your own. I also don't do digital games, though if you're a smart digital game designer, you're going to be uh, using manual games as a prototype uh, for your digital game. So a lot of the stuff that I talk about uh, does apply. So there's some interest, there's, I, I break this down into interesting issues and management issues, management issues being inherently uninteresting. Uh, and so some of the interesting issues is there's, there, there's uh, as I was thinking about this, there's certain issues that are sort of embedded in climate games. Uh, there are things that are sort of fundamental to climate games that make them a little bit different than other kinds of games. And I wanna talk about those. Uh, and then I wanna talk about the topic we all like to hear about, which is relating player actions to outcomes, or what we call in the gaming community, adjudication. How do you relate what the players do to what happens in the world, uh, and then feed that back to the players? And in climate games, there's some interesting things involved, and I'm going to talk about cli modeling, uh, climate economics, and things related to climate and economics, and how that can be a bit of a challenge, particularly when you're trying to abstract those. So mortal humans can actually get their heads around it and deal with it in the context of a game. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to talk about dealing with time, the future, and change, and because that's an inherent aspect to what I call climate games and what I think of when I say climate games. Uh, and that is in turn related to player roles, the agency they have, and the decisions they make. And so throughout this, I want to be talking a little bit about, hey, what are the players going to do in the game? because that really matters, and do they have agency to make any effect? And if you follow the news, it's not clear that a lot of people have agency to actually affect climate change. It is a, it is a process within a process, uh, within, and there's a lot of different processes that affect carbon inter introduction in the atmosphere, carbon removal from the atmosphere, and there's no overarching dictator that controls all that stuff. So it makes it a little bit of a challenge when you're dealing with games. I'm then going to talk a little bit very briefly about managing climate games. I've been a manager uh, in this space for a while. I'm no longer a manager, but I'm adjacent to management. Uh, and uh, so I want to talk about a few issues that come up when you're dealing with climate games. First of all, workforce, 
Uh, everybody wants to be Captain Planet, uh, especially those people under 30 want to be Captain Planet and save the world. Meantime, I have as a manager, Chinese and Russians to fight. And a lot of people are willing to pay me a lot more money to fight Chinese and Russians than they are to uh, do climate change games. This may actually be changing by what I was told by Sebastian this morning or this afternoon uh, in that the WIF, the Wargaming Initiative Fund, apparently now has $2 million uh, devoted to climate games uh, coming in from OSD, which may explain the fact that we have 29 people in the room. Uh, that's a significant influx of money into the climate gaming space. A lot of my experience has been out. I, I've had some experience inside of DOD, but a lot of my experience has been outside of DOD dealing with uh, foundations and other government agencies than the Department of Defense. Uh, and so take that into account as I, as I talk about these things. I'm also going to talk about sponsors, again, tending to draw on my experience outside of DOD uh, uh, in terms of their uh, interactions. Uh, and I do characterize them as Groot, Godzilla, and Galacticus, Galacticus being the worst of them. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about players, particularly dealing with climate SMEs uh, and how to manage those sorts of people. Um, so what do I mean when I say climate change? What I, I mean, these are the definitions from the UN framework, uh, framework convention on climate change. They have really bizarre acronyms. Uh, and the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, these are the definitions of what climate change is. The key thing here is that when I think of climate change, I think of actual climate change. Uh, it's global, it's large scale, it's long duration, uh, it's integrated and, and, and reflects natural climatic effects. Uh, and it's mostly atmospheric. You're not gonna have an earthquake that's related to climate change, though you actually can as the glaciers melt, the ground rises, earthquakes happen, but let's ignore that. Um, and so the global aspects of this problem are where I tend to live when I think about climate change. Um, the fact that your military base is going to flood or the fact you're going to get another hurricane, those are very local and regional effects. And those have boundary conditions that are informed by climate change. Uh, but they're not climate change itself to me. So when I talk about climate change, I tend to skew towards the higher end, the global uh, nature of the problem, because it really is a global problem. And if you're going to affect climate change, you're going to have to deal with something that's global as opposed to something that's regional or local. Given that, your games are also going to have to reflect mesoscale, effect, uh, mesoscale environments and mesoscale effects in your games, which again, if anyone has played hobby games, mesoscale hobby games where the entire globe is the problem, create a lot of challenges for both the players and the designers. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So let's start off by talking a little bit about uh, issues that are sort of embedded within climate change. And I think that as a designer, you need at least to be aware that these issues are there uh, if you're designing climate games. So the first, the first thing I really wanna talk about is, is how does it work in the real world? Um, professional games require understanding and emulation of the process that supports, guides, and frames the decisions that players are going to make. So you need to understand who's making the decisions, what bureaucratic and organizational and governmental surround occurs around that decision, and then give that to the players or else they're not really in the right environment. Everybody everybody seems to focus a lot of times on the modeling and the simulation and the math and that sort of stuff which is okay, but it's the organizational context. It's the legal and international framework context where this stuff gets done, okay? And so if you're thinking about how you affect climate change, it's really at the nation state, head of state level affects global climate change. And so as you're thinking about climate change and where to place your players and what you have your players to do, you need to think about what are the processes that are involved in the system? And whether those processes actually involve climate change or do they involve something else? And so let's take, for example, a, a game that is notionally climate change because it's about adaptation. Definitions, adaptation is responding or trying to change the way you behave or, or you live in order to adapt to climate change. Mitigation is trying to reduce climate change uh, through reduction of carbon in the atmosphere. And so those are the those are the two different ways to think about climate change. Very different from the terminology used in disaster response, which confuses me all the time. 
Um, so let's talk about a Miami sea level rise game. Uh, the, the game's purpose is prefer for sea level rise. This is clearly a climate game, but the question you have is what are the players going to do? Well, the players aren't really going to struggle with climate change in this game because they're going to be the mayor, Florida Department of Emergency Management, FEMA, DHS, locals, uh, local electric company, local hospitals. Those kind of people are going to be the players in the game. They have very little. Yeah, sure, they can make you buy paper grocery bags, but, but they have very little effective influence on global climate change. Their, their actions are not necessarily going to reflect in the local temperature of the oceans around them, which is the main problem for these guys, nor is it going to affect the Arctic melting, which are the main problems for these guys. And so what are they doing? Well, they're making decisions, but they're making decisions about stuff they do every day, tax planning, uh, uh, seawalls, flood control, drainage, water supply, utilities, uh, and the effects of rising sea level on things like storm surge, storm, storm water removal, sewer systems, water pipes, um, erosion control, because Lord knows everything's made out of sand on these beaches and it will move. Uh, environmental impacts and you know the 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 estuaries and such are going to have are going to have eutrophication because it's getting hotter and the sea level is rising and that sort of stuff and you're getting less fresh water into them so uh so those are the kind of decisions that they're making which are things that they're making all the time they're they're worried about eutrophication in, in the estuaries already because of runoff of uh runoff of uh pestis of uh fertilizers and that sort of stuff from the from the yards so so those decisions are not necessarily climate decisions, but rather decisions about managing and urban planning and other things like that. Climate is really an input to that. The expected sea level rise, flooding, yeah, you have to get all that stuff right, but it's not what the players are going to be doing. And that's kind of what I wanted to emphasize is that a lot of times in climate games, it's like, oh, we're doing a climate game, it's different. Well, it's not that much different. You just have different boundary conditions on the particular uh, particular uh, problem. Uh, I do want to I do want to mention Robert's question. Insurers are likely to impact financial markets when flooded claims due to event results from climate change. Uh, and if you let insurers off the hook, you hurt property owners. I, I I've had a house in Florida. The insurance situ situation on the East Coast and the West Coast of Florida are 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 significant. And uh, and very interesting. Uh, obviously, if a hurricane destroys your house every year, the the cost of your insurance will be the price of your house plus five percent. So so you've got a you've got a real problem in the model of insurance when disasters occur with enough frequency that it that it really starts affecting affecting your rates. So uh, anyway, yeah, and and the insurance that's another game. <laughs> if you introduce insurance into it, you got another game. One of the things for sea level rise, for example, is you might have. Uh, issues with insurability for certain areas of your city, but you already kind of have that, and you already have to worry about that. And the processes you use for worrying about insurability are the same whether it's climate change or it's something else. Uh, so uh, what we have are essentially climate change categories. We have the idea of response, and that's dealing with the immediate effects of climate change. You have a Cat 5 hurricane into Miami, Florida Department of Emergency Management is well-versed on how to deal with hurricanes. Uh, FEMA is pretty well-versed on how to deal with hurricanes. They respond. That is a response effort to a hurricane. It has very little to do in terms of learning about climate change. Then you have adaptation issues, where you're trying to minimize the effects of climate change, like the sea level rise game. You also have adjacent games that deal with stuff like deforestation or food security that don't that are even more further removed from climate change, but are affected by climate change. And finally, you have games on mitigation, which tend to be focused on the international global spectrum of trying to reduce carbon emissions and keep the temperature from going out of control. Those mitigation games are at the heart, in my opinion, of climate change games. And the rest of these are other kinds of games that have boundary conditions that involve climate change. And so as a designer, I think it's important just to, just to have that in your mind, both when you're designing the game and also when you're talking to the sponsor. Because if you don't, you can get very easily mixed up and have games that are not quite right for what you're trying to do. Um, 
And so the question I always have is, how do the processes align? Do the processes used in your game align with what you're expecting to do in the game or get out of the game, right? In uh, align games, you have processes involving either adaptation or mitigation, and those decisions are about responding to offsets, carbon limits, geopolitical and strategic changes, or in adaptation games, you're in kind of this mid-space. For adjacent games, such as, like I said, a food, food security is the primary one that everybody gets jacked around about. Uh, for adjacent games, there's boundary conditions, there's processes that are affected by climate change, but the underlying processes are not climate change. And in fact, in food security, it may not have a lot to do with climate change because there's enough food to go around. It's governmental and economic and marketplace decisions that cause dislocations that tend to produce things like the 2010 uh, food insecurity that occurred in the Arab world, where various countries began closing down their borders and limiting food exchange in the response to a potential shortage. And so that has very little to do with climate change. It has everything to do with market dislocations. So as a designer for these games, you need to think about, does the process align with a climate process or is there something else I need to do? And should the sponsor be aware of that? given what I'm trying to do in the game. And with, with any game related idea, it's a spectrum. Disaster response games, they're, they're not really about climate. On the other hand, mitigation games are very much about climate. And in between there's this gray area where there's climate influence things and climate provides the boundary conditions, but it's not necessarily about responding to climate itself. And so that's, uh, those, are, those are some ways to think about it. There's some other issues too that are common issues that I find are inherent in the nature of climate games, or at least in the way people think about climate games. And one of them is this myth and reality. And this is changing a little bit because everybody's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of hot outside. Uh, but nonetheless, you still tend to encounter uh, this problem where uh, people tend to think that climate change games are often derailed by skepticism, politics, and other such things. I, I don't find that to be true. Even people who are skeptical of, uh, of uh, climate and, 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 and that sort of stuff, when they're put in the context of a professional game, they're, they're going to it for a business or, or a, a organizational purpose. They tend to say, okay, all right, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and, and color and do what I need to do. Um, and so you don't tend to get a lot of uh, inherent skepticism uh, certainly from the participants in the game and from the sponsors in the game. Um, and the reality, though, is, is that climate change games, in my experience, are often derailed by disagreements within the climate community, especially about something I call the presentation of severity, which we'll, I'll talk about next. Those disagreements within the climate community, which go back to sponsors uh, and sponsors disagreeing with sponsors, uh, actually makes it quite hard sometimes to do climate games. Uh, and so if you're worried about the first issue in your climate games, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Instead, I would be very careful in dealing with my sponsors, particularly for games that are outside of DOD. I mean, games inside of DOD are a little different, but games outside of DOD are often in the community of climate change, uh, where people are whose whole purpose in some cases is advocacy, building public policy around climate change, uh, building, building uh, funding for climate change. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of at stake for them professionally within that context, not so much within DOD a lot of times. And so uh, that can make things a bit harder. So as a, as a game designer, you need to think about those as you're going along. Then there's this question of presentation of severity. Um, um, <laughs> I also want to take this question from uh, from Justin, from uh, Justin Souls. Uh, question, how do you make sure you keep and maintain alignment between you and a game sponsors when it comes to designing climate games? You have to be honest with them. And I, I, I that's the whole reason I'm talking about this is you have to be aware of it. So you don't just go in, da, 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 I'm doing a climate game. Um, you have to be aware that this pitfall exists. Uh, and then you have to be honest with them. Typically, uh, 
um, not what I would call naive sponsors, sponsors that are not involved in the climate change community, will be the one to make the mistake of calling something a climate change game and wanting to draw larger conclusions from it uh, than they would necessarily be justified doing, given what you just just ran the game on. And so that misalignment tends to occur about sponsor with sponsors, which is a particular DOD issue with sponsors who don't have as much experience in the climate community uh, and may not really understand the processes and so forth. Uh, and so if you're dealing with a material command, uh, uh, a naval material command uh, sponsor who's trying to do something with climate change, they may have be less informed than the OSD Office for Climate Change. Uh, and even less, in, and, and they may be even less informed than the, than the White House Special Security Advisor on climate change. And so, so those, those kind of uh, differences you'll see, and you need to help the first sponsor of the Naval Material Command, and you need to be, um, make sure that, that you're aligned with the, uh, with the second kind of sponsor. And the third sponsor, um, you need to heed the previous slide. Um, and so, um, okay. Uh, Andrew Olson asked, in your experience, how open are sponsors, particularly in the security, I assume security community, open to the inclusion of climate impacts and say there are 2040 game uh, timeframe games? Um, now you're talking about games that don't have anything to do with climate change, but we're going to put something in, uh, in terms of climate impacts to a 2040 game. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say they're close to it. And I wouldn't say that they're close to the concept of including in the scenario. Um, but on the other hand, it oftentimes can be a distraction. Same thing as running a typhoon through your carrier battle group uh, lay down for a China scenario. You can do it, but it's good, unless you're looking at the effects of typhoons on your, on your strategy, it's going to be a distraction. It's just going to irritate everyone. Uh, and I think that, that that may be a better way to think about it uh, in terms of non- non-climate games that you're going to include climate in. Uh, it can be a marginal distraction, but when the bombs are flying, you're not really worried too much about, about, uh, about climate. Um, okay, so presentation of severity. This is a concept that I've come up with based on my experience in dealing with the climate community, is that there's a lot of reluctance in, in the IPCC reports, though it's changing, uh, and in the climate community to go with uh, the worst case scenarios, to talk about the worst case scenarios. Instead, there's a lot of tendency to want to mitigate, uh, to use, use that word in a different way, to mitigate sort of the effects of climate change in order to not be seen as extreme um, uh, chicken littles, the sky is falling, everything's going to go bad. Uh, we can deal with this. It's, it's going to be bad, but it's not going to be catastrophic. Those kind of things uh, are common in my experience in the climate community, at least for the last 20 years. Now, that may be changing because it looks like it may be changing. Um, but, and, and we actually, for the, for the conference in IPC, the IPCC conference in France, uh, the UN conference in France a, a while ago where they did, I think it was IPCC five, we did a game that was, that was, uh, that was much more extreme in terms of temperature profiles uh, to, try to try to get some of those effects across uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but the problem with that is that games often, to be interesting, don't deal with the average situation or below average situation. Rather, you want something to put in the game to stress the processes, to create tension within the players. Uh, my favorite thing is the North Atlantic Oscillation. If that thing goes away, Europe freezes. Okay, let's, let's assume that. I'm, I, I'm a little rusty, but let's assume Europe freezes if the NALO goes away. Uh, NALO, North Atlantic Oscillation you put that in there and you've changed the future. You've changed the future in a big way. Uh, lots of stuff is impacted. Food production's impacted. Uh, your, Europe is impacted. Energy supplies are impacted. A whole bunch of stuff is impacted if the NALO goes away. That creates a really interesting game scenario, but it's very, very much too extreme in a lot of times for the kind of sponsorship you're going to deal with. They don't want to necessarily deal with that. And so while the science may say it's possible, it's it may not say it's likely, but it's, it may say it's possible. The politics of such a thing are hard. I think that's getting a little bit easier now that we're seeing ourselves on kind of a bad track. But still, I would be cautious about it if I was doing climate change games and come in with the assumption that I'm going to be using an IPCC middle of the road scenario, typically, not one of the more extreme scenarios. 
So um, uh, let's let me answer a couple of other. Um, do you th uh, Kevin asks, do you think games on climate change would be better received uh, if they were not branded as such? Recover from natural disasters or something to that effect. Um, you know, if it's a natural disaster recovery game, those are standard games. FEMA funds lots of them every year uh, for state and locals to, to practice. Um, so it's 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 not really a climate change game. And so for me, um, I actually don't see that. I don't see climate change games being badly received. Uh, I have not encountered that myself. Uh, I don't think they're badly received. I think there's a lot of interest in them. I think within the community, they're, they're at least they were a relatively unique thing to do. And so the community felt like it was something that was advancing the ball down the field uh, in terms of advocacy for response to climate effects. Uh, and I think that, you know, in terms of cities like Miami, looking at uh, looking at um, uh, flooding from sea level rise, those are pretty well received in terms of, wow, I got to do this and that and the other thing in order to respond to it. At least I can create a laundry list of potential effects that I had not already thought of. So I, I'm, I disagree with the premise. I don't think they're, they're poorly received. And I think rebranding them would be would be bad because you're saying there's something they're not. And I, I tend towards being very transparent, very straightforward about, about things like that. Brian asked, how about a pro solar punk solar punk game? I mean, how do we, we redesign or shape a community in a positive way? Um, so like a pro solar game. Um, yes, I mean, the, the UK has done some games on how cities are gonna respond through urban planning to potential climate effects, um, those kind of things. But when you start talking about solar, you, you're also talking, we'll talk about this. In fact, this, this segues right into what I'm about to talk about, which is relating actions to outcomes. How do you adjudicate climate games? And by climate games now, I'm talking about the MISO scale, world shattering, we're gonna do a climate game, not a mitigation game, not an adaptation game. Because for an adaptation game, it's easy. You just run the disaster response or community planning scenario uh, and processes and you're good to go. But if you're dealing with a mitigation scenario where you're talking about carbon emissions, geoengineering, those kind of things, you're talking about a much bigger problem. Um, and so uh, Zoe asks, can you compare running climate game errors <laughs> with experts, uh, scientists, urban planners versus lay people, politicians, students, et cetera? Are there particular challenges with one versus the other? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in a later slide when I talk about players, uh, but there are particular challenges with playing with the scientists um, and with uh, with some of the experts in climate change. So we can we, I'll, I'll allude to some of those issues uh, later. Uh, but in general, I mean, assuming all everybody behaves themselves, which we'll get to later, uh, assuming everyone behaves themselves, um, the difference is going to be that you're going to be providing the expertise as the designer controller for the game uh, if you're dealing with lay people. If you're dealing with experts, they're going to be providing the expertise because some of these experts are really, you know, Harvard PhD uh, professor at Harvard that that has worked his entire life or her entire life on uh, climate effects and, and uh, various economic issues associated with it. So they're going to be the experts and you're going to be the, the person facilitating that. And so that's the biggest difference in my in my view uh, with this. Um, so climate change is a global phenomenon. Uh, and you want to examine the decisions. If you want to examine these decisions at a global MISO scale, uh, um, uh, so at a global MISO scale, um, you're not going to be focused on adaptation or consequences. Uh, where you just have to model the local process. You're going to be modeling the global process. And as as I keep saying, as, as board war gamers know, modeling the entire globe, whether it's for warfare, whether it's for economics, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. Well, let's just review the carbon process because there's you can modularize this and say this is what I have to have to sort of deal with when I'm dealing with a with a meso scale mitigation game. Uh, you have the economy. Uh, so the economy generates carbon. Everything poops carbon out the back, uh, whether it's methane, whether it's CO2, carbon goes into the atmosphere. Carbon in the atmosphere creates greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect increases temperature. Temperature in turn has, creates various effects from migration to storms. Um, 
to fires, to sea level rise. And in turn, those effects feed back into the economy in ways that you, you might not be fully aware of. Uh, in addition to destroying ports and doing sea level rise and destroying property and stuff like that and burning forests so you can't use them for lumber. Uh, in addition, you have a temperature increase in the process water going into your processes for your economy. And by processes, I mean electrical generation requires a temperature difference. All this work being done in electrical generation requires some sort of temperature difference uh, for coolant. Likewise, in a lot of chemical processes, it requires a thermal difference uh, to be able to condense, uh, uh, condense things, uh, cool things, um, things like that. That temperature difference gets less as the makeup water for the process gets hotter. Uh, and that increases your energy demand for the processes. It also increases the expense of those processes. So that feeds back into the economy. Uh, and not in a small way, uh, particularly for electrical generation. So you got to kind of think about that too. Whether you take into account is kind of your thing because it's 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 a a lot of this stuff is marginal, but nonetheless, uh, it's a way that it feeds back into the economy uh, and affects things. In addition to that, see that little umbrella down there? Mitigation, where you're actively trying to do something or not so actively trying to do something, is also going to change the fraction of the economic activity that converts into carbon. So this is where you get to a solar. Solar, uh, use of solar to generate electricity and consequent electrification of things um, create, mitigates or reduces the amount of carbon emissions in the future. This happens, this can happen because of governmental efforts like the Biden administration throwing some money at the problem, or it can happen through simple economics and individual decisions where everybody goes, I'm gonna go out and buy an electric car or I'm gonna have a fleet of electric cars uh, and so forth. Uh, and sometimes it's a synergy. And so you've got to take into account the fact that as time goes on, mitigation efforts in some countries are going to change things. So uh, there's a whole bunch of comments here. Um, uh, Merle asks, are there sources you feel that are useful recognizing the shortcomings in the current data sets for benchmarking adjudication effects? Yes, I'm going to get to that next. But I will tell you, the IPCC is your friend. Without regard, just Google IPCC, you'll find it. A uh, great bunch of people, thousands of scientists doing millions of hours of work you don't have to do. And so IPCC is a great way to skate through the climate effects. Um, and Robert says, uh, uh, there's a Daybreak board game coming out in 2023, not exactly solar punk, but positive co-op game about changing the future. Again, I'm not talking about board games, I'm talking about professional games. But yes, there's there's a lot of other space where you can do, do climate games, including hobby games, like what they're talking about with Daybreak, uh, or also uh, within educational games. Very similar issues apply though. Uh, so what do you have to do as the poor game designer that's gonna do this global mitigation game? Well, you have to model the economy, okay? And for economy, what I fundamentally need is activity, economic activity, productivity uh, versus time. How's this going to play out over time? And remember I said, climate change occurs over a long time scale. So I need a, times, a, a time measure of a long scale and how economic activity is going to change over a long time. We can't predict it very well over a short time, just, I'm just saying. Um, and so I, how, and how do player decisions about the economy, spending more on semiconductors, spending more on mitigation efforts, spending more on electrification. How is that going to change the carbon output of the economy, uh, both in terms of the fraction of carbon generated for each bazillion dollars of GDP, as well as how many bazillion dollars of GDP do you have for the various countries? And this is the entire world, remember. So it's a, it's a fairly large problem you're dealing with here. Also, when you ask about the economy, you can also ask how much effect does a government have on the economy? And even in a place like China, the economic activity is not as closely tied to the government as you might wish it were, or maybe not wish it were. Uh, the government has a relatively modest set of tools that it can do to change the economy and to even change the governmental spending priorities. I mean, you know, I think it was like a couple hundred million, two to 400 million that was spent on mitigation in the US 
uh, in the Biden administration versus 1.5 trillion in the overall budget. That's a drop in the bucket. And so it's it's a very marginal set of tools that the players have to play with when you start talking about affecting these things. Um, and then in addition to that, I need activity versus emissions. How do emissions change as economic activity change, which are in turn affected by mitigation, right? So I need that, I need that curve. And then I need emissions versus temperature. That actually, in my opinion, is the easy part because the IPC has done, IPCC has done a lot of that work for you. Uh, and then if you get the temperature, you get the effects of frequency of events by temperature, which is not, is, is in the IPCC reports, but it's also in the literature. Uh, I end up a lot of times going to literature to look at the effects. And for things like migration, those are just gonna have to be based on sort of DOD Intel assessments or your own assessments about how likely it is different countries will be destabilized because of the situation. So let's talk about each one of these and some of the ways you can think about it in an abstract sense um, to try to get it into your game. Uh, so the economy, you have, you have uh, economic, economic options in your game that you can use to try to understand this relationship between time and GDP. There are GDP, I'm using GDP gross domestic product as a, as a, 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 a gauge for economic activity. There are other things you could use. I tend to prefer GDP just because it's easy and that's what everybody projects. Uh, you can use GDP projections by places like the UN by year, by country great. It doesn't go out that far sometimes. And even then, it's merely a percentage increase, peanut buttered across all the years. So that may or may not fit your bill as to what you want to do, given, you know, for example, the latest recession, given the changes that have occurred in the Chinese economy, it can be tricky uh, to just use straight line GDP projections. If you do that, I will tell you that this century is China's, the next hundred years are India's, and then after that, Africa begins to take off. If you look at changes in in, uh, in GDP, carbon emissions, of course, um, relate to GDP, and of course, mitigation can wreak havoc with this uh, um, uh, with this problem. Uh, also, as I said, temperature affects cooling water. IPCC is is a good uh, good place for trying to understand uh, these relationships. Um, in addition to that, the other thing you need to know is that, is that it's not a, there's a global average temperature that you're going to have, and that's going to change with regard to climate effects. But then you also have regionalization of that temperature change. And so certain areas are going to get hotter, and certain areas are going to get less hot, less fast, uh, based on the global climatic, atmospheric, whatever's. Uh, and so it's really kind of sort of regionalized in terms of car in terms of temperature change, uh, especially when you're talking like tenths of a degree. Um, uh, and so you also need to sometimes take that into account, particularly if you're trying to look at the combined effects of all these different regions uh, on climate change. Um, uh, Brian asks, how might we model decisions in favor of no growth or degrowth? I love that decision. <laughs> no growth. Hey, right, got it. <laughs> I just said GDP in my model is GDP growth in my model is zero, and we're good to go. Uh, I can I can model that. Um, if uh, if uh, if it, degrowth is is the opposite question, how fast are you going to degrow? Uh, and and then at, at the same time, I think you have to ask yourself as an adjudicator uh, what effect that's going to have on society, because most of Western uh, economic models are based on a continuous growth uh, in the economy. And when you have negative growth uh, or deflation effectively, uh, that can really upset the apple cart and cause a lot of just as many problems as, as tremendous inflation uh, and a hyper, hyper effective growth. So, um, uh, and I am, that is the limit of my economics knowledge. I would go talk to an economist. Um, there's some other options. Uh, if you're, if you're taking a local approach, changes to the local economy won't matter much. So you're dealing with a game in California. California really wants to do mitigation. So they're gonna make everybody drive an electric car. That's just great. But it's not, it's gonna have an effect globally of some amount of carbon that goes in the atmosphere. 
but it won't necessarily have a big effect on California unless you're looking at other sorts of emissions, nitrous oxides, particulate matter, that sort of stuff. Um, and, and so, so your, your, your game for in terms of mitigation effects at a, at a, at a local level, it doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, have to model much in terms of, in terms of overall effects of mitigation. Um, if you're dealing with some sort of a regional game uh, where there's internal mitigation strategies and, and, and sort of uh, one of the, one of the concepts that, that I, I, I dealt with one time was, uh, was deforestation and, uh, forest products coming out of the, the Latin American and South American regions. And so there you're, and, and the effects of climate on that. And there you're gonna have to have some sort of a regional economic model where you're looking at ins and outs of the various countries, but not the entire globe. Uh, global economic models may exist, but I think if you can access them, you have to ask yourself, how are the players going to access them? Uh, my advice, if I had a global economic model that actually worked and I trusted, uh, would be to run it for them and come up with those curves and then base it on something simple on those curves to try to generate the climate effects, as opposed to trying to run some sort of giant model uh, as part of the game. As I said, the climate's the easy part. IPCC reports synthesize all the recent climate research and modeling and fit into one handy dandy place. They're not short. And they're not necessarily an easy read. And they're written in a very conservative style. And they mostly focus on conservative scenarios. You will see now with the IPCC 6, I think they do sort of branch off and talk about less conservative scenarios, simply because that's becoming the conservative scenario. Um, but, uh, um, but there are scenarios where much of the mid-latitude equatorial tropics becomes literally uninhabitable by humans uh, because the temperature is too hot. And so those kind of scenarios uh, are not something they dwell on. Um, uh, and, and you may need to refine certain elements through uh, excursions, uh, particularly migration flows, how that's going to affect different countries. That's more of a country stability model, which do exist and you can use. Uh, you can look them up in the literature. Um, and also establishing boundary conditions for some place like Miami. Just like with temperature, sea level rise is not going to be uniform across the globe, so you're going to need to know local uh, sea level rise conditions uh, for the particular area you're in. Again, the IPCC usually does a pretty good job of that kind of stuff. Uh, Brian says, I can see how easy it would be to say, move a counter along a track from GDP to plus one to GDP of minus one, harder to simulate the political and cultural responses. That is a great segue into my next and next slide, which is migration effects. And then the slide after that, I think is cultural effects. Uh, migration of, uh, mitigation effects. Um, I'll talk about the cultural stuff in a little bit. Uh, mitigation effects, this is the most difficult and probably the most controversial part of the thing. A lot of people have a lot of vested interest riding on mitigation. Uh, and therefore, the place where you're going to see a lot of potential controversy is how much mitigation effects are going to happen, are, are going to have. Like, for example, geoengineering. You're either for geoengineering or against geoengineering. If you're for geoengineering, it works great. And it's not going to have any problems. If you're against geoengineering, ah, we can't use that. It's terrible. Uh, and it's a danger. It's a menace to society. We need to, you know, get in shape and, and, and eat, eat healthy. So, um, that can be the place where you get the most arguments. IPCC has to look at mitigation and also has to look at economics. Because remember, what the IPC is trying to do is trying to project temperature changes across time. Temperature changes are driven by the economics. They're driven by mitigation efforts. So they have to do all that science for you. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing because there's a lot of literature out there and if you try to read all the literature yourself, which you can do, uh, you're going to get both confused and you're going to have a lot to read. Uh, so really for mitigation effects, I would go to the IPCC first. If I'm not getting what I want to from it, maybe there's some weird thing either on the geoengineering or uh, different types of electrification or something where you solar fusion energy comes online, um, then you may need to go to the literature and try to project the engineering aspects from the literature. And this is an engineering question, right? I would say, okay, in 2060, fusion energy is finally projected to come online. It's always 30 years out. Uh, but, but let's put a pin in it saying 2060, fusion is going to come online. 
What's that going to do in terms of reducing energy input over the next 20 or 30 years from 2060 to 2080 uh, as fusion energy comes online? How much are they going to cost? How, how long are they going to take to build? How much are they going to, what are they going to replace? Are they only, only going to provide excess capacity? Uh, because the economy is still growing, right? It's your whatever GDP rate the UN gave you. Um, and so, uh, and so are they, and what countries are they going to affect? That's that, those sort of questions. So it's still an engineering problem that you have to do. Uh, it's just that you need to consult the literature and then, and then sort of project ahead on what's going to happen. And then finally, experts, experts uh, who've devoted their lives to this problem uh, will be glad to share with you in some cases uh, what their, um, uh, their viewpoint would be. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, Brian says, now there's a thought that a sim of geoengineering where the processes and the outcomes are randomly determined during the game. Uh, in, in one of the games I did, I actually had, okay, you can do geoengineering, but every turn, there is a finite chance that it's going to go haywire, and it's going to do something you had not anticipated, uh, and that and the thing you had not anticipated will be bad. Do you still want to do it? And the scientists, of course, who do geoengineering said, yeah, 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 yeah. And they turned out they rolled pretty well and they saved themselves. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you can do that sort of thing. And I would say that when you're starting talking about these mesoscale effects and when you start tinkering around at the mesoscale, you will have unexpected and unanticipated outcomes. And that's something you have to account for. Uh, Walter says, a lot of this would seem to lend itself to cooperative... What, what, cooperative games where players' mitigation effectiveness is measured against one another or they compete for grants and resources. Um, again, grants and resources are going to be a minor thing towards mitigation when you're talking about changing every car in America to an electric vehicle and every car in Europe to an electric vehicle. The, the, the grants and resources, this is, this is at the national level. Um, and now you can have a game where, you know, this is, this is a, a meta game not a mesoscale game, but a meta game where you're playing different climate change, dealing with organizations, different different types of uh, of NGOs and uh, other government organizations who are competing for funding and competing for influence in the climate space, uh, and the, the, the goal might be to try to understand the best strategy for that organization to obtain grants and resources. That that's a standard organizational game, and it and it would be a, a very appropriate game for the community. Um, so um, so that's 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 the mitigation efforts, and I will talk about the the other question in just a second. Um, but in addition to you know we talked about the modeling of it and the fact that it's a long term problem, particularly for mesoscale mitigation games. Um, these games occur over much longer scales than we're accustomed to. You know, the DOD plans for the fit up, it plans out to 2030. Now it's probably planning to 2040. I haven't been involved in a few years, um, but those are short timelines for climate change. And if you're really talking about the serious impacts of potential climate change or the serious impacts of mitigation geoengineering efforts, you're talking way beyond that. And we're not used to dealing with games in that, in that territory. And so let's talk a little bit about these long time problems in games. And this is, as again, I go back to board war gamers. Board war gamers will tell you it is not an easy problem going out uh, into the distant future. Uh, and so when you start talking about short term versus long term in climate change, uh, the IPCC 6, the International Panel on Cl Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, had, had meets like every two years and they number their their meetings. And so the IPCC 6 is the most recent version. And I pulled that from this from here, from there. Um, it, and I said, okay, what's short-term, what's long-term for IPCC? That's 2040. 2040, anything shorter than 2040 is short-term, anything longer than 2040 is long-term. What happens to those curves? This is a curve of time versus temperature uh, for different projections for different IPCC scenarios. Uh, what happens to those curves at 2040? They all diverge. <laughs> so ah, long-term, we're gonna deal with it. Short-term, yeah, okay, we can deal with it. So when you're, so, and 2040 is a lot, is, is less than 20 years out, right? Um, and so when you're talking climate change, if you wanna get to that divergent group, 
where your efforts in your first planning phase in the game have put you on a curve and you want to see what the effects of that curve are. Remember, you know, players make decisions. We show them what the effects are. They make more decisions. That's a long time. You're talking 2050 before you're going to get a really good idea, unless you're on the 8.5 curve, in which case you're, you're in a lot of trouble anyway, um, which we're probably not on, I would think, uh, I would hope. Um, um, and so uh, the, the bend in the curve has to do with mitigation. Bend in the curve says, okay, we're, we, we've done things back in 2020 that have bent the curve and we're not going winging off into uh, into very, very bad territory. Um, uh, yeah, role-playing games have no problems going out. Uh, Traveler, Star Wars, that sort of stuff. Board games have a hard time going out because they have to model it and, and it's quite difficult to model these mesoscale effects. So the po two points, one, IPCC's done it for you. You got your different models. You can put yourself on a curve. Um, your sponsor may, not, may or may not like the curve that you're on, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you put yourself on a curve. You got your you got your relationship between time and temperature. Uh, if you don't want the players fiddling with the economy, if you want the players fiddling with the economy, those curves are going to move. Uh, but you're going to have to do this over a long time period. Is my point. Decisions in time. Who makes decisions? In the current world, over a 10-year, let's just take a 10-year turn step. Who makes decisions over a 10-year timescale? Very few politicians, maybe Putin, maybe Xi over in China, maybe makes decisions over that kind of timescale. But very few politicians, especially in the democratic countries um, or in countries that are less stable, make decisions over that timescale. So who are the players in those games? Are they some sort of abstract process? Uh, are they sort of the country? Um, and so you get into this problem, not only the not only this long time scale, but the player roles and what decisions the players make. Likewise, what decisions are they going to be making? Yeah, civilization, for example. Um, uh, you, it is possible to make decisions over that time frame without being autocratic, but you can't really model the political process in the game exactly. Uh, our election cycles, Indian's election cycles are between four and six years for democracies, uh, for, the, for the executive. Uh, and so that kind of time step may work. It may give you too many time steps going out to 2080, if that's how far you're going. Um, you may have to, I, I went with 10 year time steps, which is roughly two US administrations um, and assuming that they get reelected, which a lot of times they don't, but let's assume they get reelected. Yeah, they have an influence over about a 10 year period. Uh, and then you can model that by having an opposition party. Again, you're increasing the complexity of the game. You're putting this political model in the game then. Uh, but for this kind of game, politics really matters, not so much about whether climate change exists. Politics really matters about economic policy, about foreign policy, about policies with respect to migration in particular. Um, and so those kind of things uh, can be used. Um, in addition, you have the problem of technology and time. If you haven't noticed, there's been a very large change in technology as we've moved across the years. One would assume that that's going to continue out in the future. How do you represent it? Well, here we do have good models from role-playing and board and miniature games uh, for how to deal with technology. And that is in the game Harpoon, which is a naval combat game for electronic countermeasures and electronic counter countermeasures, uh, they use a tech level approach. And this is sort of, okay, there's level one, two, three, four, and five. If you have a level five, it certainly beats a level one, probably beats a level two, can beat a level three, and is going to beat a level four sometimes. Uh, that kind of leveling approach removes your need as a controller or scenario writer to specify what the future is going to look like, and you're sort of generalizing the future. Uh, Traveler does this too with its, its, its various tech levels for everything from software to computers. Um, that's one option. Another option, is to, which is what I tend to prefer, which is to say, okay, all the people in the world, all the various countries, are, over the course of a bunch of years, are probably going to get the same technology. It's not like you're going to invent fusion and the other guy's not going to get fusion eventually within a few years right? Uh, it's been more or less the same for technology across a quite a long time frame. 
Uh, and so you can fairly say that, okay, the ratio of technology between all the countries in the world is gonna stay relatively fixed and everybody's gonna have access to the same level of technology. And so therefore I don't have to say what the technology is. I can just say that, well, it's kind of, it's kind of even Steven. It's kind of puts us roughly where we are now, which may or may not be true. Some technologies may advance, uh, um, uh, help some countries and not others. I would claim that AI will help more authoritarian countries because they can simply say, hey, yeah, I don't care if I kill a couple extra ships. Uh, whereas as more democratic and law abiding countries might say, hey, we don't want to kill civilians. So we, we got to be more careful. Um, those, th those aside, holding the ratio, uh, ratio um, uh, constant is a, is a good thing. Thomas says, traveler outreach and star force. I didn't think to trigger my gamer nostalgia. Yes, I'm a very nostalgic gamer. I grew up in the 70s doing games, so uh, playing games. So Star Soldier is one of my favorites. Anyway, uh, Star Soldier is actually an incredibly interesting game for projecting future technology. I have to say, if you haven't read, looked at Star Soldier and you want to project future technology, do that because it's a very clever concept. Um, that is study. Uh, what actually, when does technology matter? It matters for the military and it matters for production and economics efficiency, particularly for mitigation. So if you have any technology that you want to pay attention to, it should be probably mitigation type technologies. And you can also throw in some chrome or extra stuff. One of the things I like to throw in is the, as the, as the uh, snow melts in the Antarctic, um, companies go down there and start strip mining, start, start uh, strip mining it for minerals and producing oil out of it. Uh, and that can produce a source of conflict. It can also enhance global warming and enhance problems with the ecologies, uh, that sort of stuff. Those kind of things you can also throw in that matter for what you're trying to do in the game. Uh, but otherwise you can probably find ways to elide technology across the years. Um, uh, uh, in, a, in a way that, that sort of keeps the ratio constant. But this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. Uh, and this is what I meant. I said I would eventually get to social systems. Social systems also advance with time. One of my best games ever we did uh, and the outstanding, the, the conclusion that occurred from every, we played it five times, from every time that was played. Uh, and this was back well before the Arab Spring, well before the, uh, the migration that came out of the Middle East. Um, uh, well, actually, it was it was it was coterminous with that. Um, was that Western societies would change based on the effects of climate change, particularly mass migration, would cause Western societies to change in terms of how they dealt with their governments. They would become more authoritarian. They would become more reactionary than they were at the time. This. This this was well before this was well before Trump or before anything like that happened, and now it's coming to coming to pass. So I thought that was a very predictive sort of game uh, that came across and said, "Hey, because I'd never seen the idea that Western societies would change. Everybody else changes all the time because you know, but Western societies changing because of different influences was not something I'd ever encountered before in a game. I thought that was noteworthy, but that's something that matters, right?" The, the social systems change across time. And in particular, a lot of the stresses that are gonna come down from climate change or could come down from climate change scenarios will have profound effects within the US, within Europe, within Western democracies, within Japan. Those changes will change the nature of governance, the way we get along with each other, all those kind of things. Uh, for example, if it gets too hot in Phoenix, Phoenix may have to evacuate. So if Phoenix evacuates because it's just too hot to live there, where are all those people going to go? What are you going to do with Phoenix? Uh, and that's going to cause a significant change in the way we think about our country. So things like that uh, matter, and you have to account for them in games. And I would say that these issues apply to local, regional, or national scales. It's just where you draw the boundary and how you set the boundary conditions. So a lot of the stuff I've been talking about in terms of mesoscale climate modeling, economics, uh, social systems, apply to things like Miami in the future, but it just has a much smaller boundary condition. And those are boundary conditions. They're not something the players can affect. But you as the game designer have to think about those in terms of the game as you try to design it. So let's talk very briefly. I know I'm about out of time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about managing climate games. Uh, as a manager, I thought I'd get this in because I've had to manage a lot of climate games. Workforce issues. Okay, 
Uh, I said earlier that, that you know, you don't get a lot of people disrupting games because of skepticism with regard to climate change. That's not necessarily true with your workforce issue. You have two problems with your workforce uh, with climate games because they're, they're a bit of a touchstone. One of which is the Captain Planet crowd. Uh, people um, that work for you that really, really are invested in this uh, as an issue and really, really want to deal with it as an issue, that's just great. It makes for a very enthusiastic group of people. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of funding outside of DOD. If you go outside of DOD, the funding levels are much, much lower from institutions uh, across the river, State Department, places like that, uh, and also from uh, various uh, non-governmental organizations that might fund climate change games. And so it's very hard to build a practice within the climate climate change space because they they just can't they just can't afford as a DC think tank they just can't afford uh, to pay the kind of rates that, that DoD pays and so as you as a manager you're going okay well I can pay my people or I can do climate change games my choice so you do some but you don't do a lot that can kind of disappoint the crowd that really wants to do it and distract from your other mission which is to deal with other types of games that people actually pay for. Um, that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is within your workforce, you can have people that are very much climate skeptic, uh, and they can potentially disrupt or potentially cause trouble with your games, uh, and certainly create a lot of arguments and waste a lot of time. And if they get mixed up with the Captain Planet crowd, that can be even worse. Okay. So as a manager, this is a workforce management problem. You've got to try to deal with the climate deniers, and you also have to keep a lid to some degree on the people that are overly enthusiastic about doing climate games and create a balance uh, so that you can both pay them and not, uh, not create, a, create a, a morale problem for either side. So that's, that's a workforce issue that I've seen uh, that you have to kind of deal with. Um, in addition, sponsors. Sponsors can be a challenge for a lot of reasons. Uh, they can have expertise. Experts in climate change can be somewhat challenging to deal with. I'll leave it at that. But experts in climate change can be can be quite challenging to deal with sometimes, um, especially if you don't know enough about the climate change literature, which says that if you're going to do it in this space, just like with cyber, just like with uh, disease response, anything like that, you should know your stuff as a game designer. You should know how this stuff works. You should know how the physics works so that you're not making mis basic mistakes in the problem. Because if you do, those experts will eat you for lunch, okay? And within climate change, they will literally eat you for lunch. So they are much worse than a lot of the other experts that I've encountered. Um, you can also have challenges in with regard to influence and rank. And I didn't put the White House in there for by as a mistake uh, or an illustration. Uh, you can, you know, uh, there's a lot of a lot of, particularly when a Democratic administration is in office, there's a lot of focus and expertise in the White House on this issue. And a lot of those can generate game opportunities. Uh, and so you're dealing now at a national level with fairly high ranking people that are very much uh, understanding climate change, have their opinions about climate change, and you have to deal with them. Uh, and that can, that can produce a challenge, both as a player as well as a sponsor. Um, and agendas, and, and the agendas are not necessarily what you think, well, yay, climate change, or boo, climate change. I already dispensed with that. The agendas are within the climate change community. Should we do geoengineering? How much mitigation is going to, how much is mitigation going to effectively electrify? How fast are we going to electrify? Those kind of controversies can pop out in your game between different experts, as well as between your sponsors uh, and other people associated with your sponsors. And then finally, the sponsors, a lot of times, when you're dealing across the river, not with the Pentagon, uh, you're dealing across the river, you're dealing with NGOs, dealing with other people, they don't have as much resources as the Department of Defense. So your price point's a lot lower for these kind of games. Uh, and so that's another challenge in addition to uh, dealing with expertise, agendas, and the, uh, and the simple rank of a lot of people that you're dealing with. And then finally, players have to be managed. Um, as we said, there may be naive and inexperienced players, in which case you're the one schooling them on climate change. Even though it's not an educational game, you need to have, you need to know who your players are that's going to, that are going to be coming, and you need to make it easy for them to make the kind of decisions that you need them to make, right? And so for a game on, on uh, adaptation uh, to sea level rise in Miami, you're going to have to be the climate expert. 
because the, the mayor is not going to know anything about climate change or may know very little about climate change and particularly about sea level rise and that sort of stuff. So you're going to have to be the expert on that. You're going to have to be able to explain that. And it's going to be part of your pre-game uh, package for the players. Um, in addition, uh, the players uh, may actually uh, understand climate effects, and they may also understand how little effect they have on this uh, and how little effect their agenda will have. And so if you go, okay, well, you know, sea level rise is going to inundate the base in Norfolk. Well, okay, yeah, but that's 10 years from now. I'm going to do this because this is what I always do. Uh, and getting the players out of that rut can be extremely challenging as you're running a game. The other problem with players is because they know too much. I, I talked about expertise uh, with regard to sponsors. You can also have the same thing with regard to expertise with regard to players, um, particularly on things like geoengineering or mitigation. You've got the world, literally have the world's expert on this subject playing in your game. If you have that, you have to rely on their expertise because you are not the world subject on the expert on that subject. But at the same time, you also have to know they probably have an agenda that whatever that is they're pushing, whether it's, you know, space, mylar, things that will cool the earth, uh, putting chaff into space, they think that's the cat's meow. And they're going to say that's going to work. OK, so you have to use your engineering training and your engineering knowledge to go, OK, can you explain that to me at least a little bit uh, so we can come up with a reasonable adjudication or get another expert who doesn't think chaff in space is going to work at all. And instead, carbon sequestration is what's really going to work and have them work it out uh, as they fight, listen to them, and then, and then adjudicate. Um, I hope throughout this, I've given you the idea that climate change games are not necessarily easy. They're not even as easy, as I think, as Department of Defense type games. They're difficult, both in terms of managing people both sponsors, your own workforce, and the players. They're also difficult in terms of adjudication, matching outcomes to actions. And they're also a big challenge in terms of a lot of the surrounding stuff that goes on with them, whether it's the long time scales or whether it's the fact that, that a lot of things that passes as uh, climate change games are really adaptation games uh, or games that have very little to do with actual decisions about climate change. Um, and so those, those, uh, those are some of the things that I was trying to get across and I hope I did. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this made sense and, uh, uh, I'll be happy to take questions and I'm going to let, let Nicholas read those that I did not respond to. Yeah, we'll just give it a few more minutes and see if anybody has any more questions for, uh, Ed. And if not, we'll call it there. Give you like 30 more seconds. <laughs> Everyone have a good night. All right, we have Brian with one last question in here. Uh, to Nate, this uh, recording should be available sometime in the next 24 hours on YouTube. But we'll just get uh, Brian's question. Uh, he asks, how to stimulate uh, an organization and institution over time under the impact of climate change? Well, it depends on what organization you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about a government or a government, for example, the United States government, um, and over a long time scale, I would actually do that AB political party. I had the Republicans and Democrats, that those are our two parties, uh, conservative and liberal. Uh, I would have players representing those, and I would have some metric for elections. Um, and if you're th talking about a smaller organization, like a business, church, university, um, that's just simulating them over time. This goes back to my first contention that, that a lot of these games aren't really climate change games. You know, if, if you're talking about, a, a, let's say a business, let's say it's, it's Microsoft, right? Uh, or or a, an investor, some, a game I've actually done, an investor in Bitcoin. Uh, and so you're, you're a Bitcoin investor, haha, uh, and you want to simulate, and you're, and you're five years ago, and you want to simulate the next 30 years for your business, right? Um, that's mostly, 99.9% mo of your problem is not climate change. 99.9% .9 of your problem is regulation, 
uh, marketplace, uh, effects of governmental decisions with regard to regulation, uh, competitors with regard to banks putting out their own coins, all those kind of things are your, that's what you're worried about. You're not worried about climate change. Uh, and so I would just go ahead and design the game uh, for that industry or for that organization that projected it out, allowed the players to project out over time. And then every now and then something climate related might happen. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a, a business that's this predominantly an import export business in Miami, you would look at what would happen to the port. You would look what happened to populations in Miami, uh, and very possibly it might need to relocate after 30 years uh, because of both sea level rise and temperature increases and changes in workforce. So do, brought on by climate change. Uh, and right. so that's, go ahead. Apologies. So Brian uh, asked a uh, kind of follow-up question. So we should expect to see climate models within broader games in the future? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I'm not sure why a war with China over Taiwan in the next 20 years would involve significant climate effects. Uh, typhoon intensity is going to increase, but the frequency and the landfall rate probably is not. If there are, I know more about the Atlantic Basin than I do the the Indo-Pacom Basin, the Indo-Pacific Basin. But I would assume it's the same effects you got there. The water's warmer, more intensive cyclones. Um, so you might got, got a few more HADRs. Uh, but you're not worried about that when you're fighting, fighting over Taiwan. You're worried about beating China about Taiwan. And typhoon comes through, oh, well, uh, I've got other things to do right now. I'll get back to that later. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing... Except maybe in these, you know, they do a lot of games on bases and, and, and you know, the BRAC, the Base Realignment Committee. People like that would be very interested in effects of climate change uh, because they would want to factor that into how they're going to realign bases and, and what bases are going to close and that sort of stuff. Um, I've looked, you know, I, I think games are a poor way. Uh, uh, Kevin says, if the Army is doing CONUS relief ops and the Navy is doing rescue ops in the Philippines, USF ground, our military would be significantly impaired. I would tend to disagree with that, but nonetheless, I, I think in analytical, which I've done papers uh, somewhere at CNA, uh, it may be it may be available from CNA. I've done the analysis on that, and you can look at the increased frequency of those kind of operations as a function of climate change, uh, and you're, you're going to be doing more but they don't have a huge impact right now. And certainly the DOD doesn't like to do them very much. I shouldn't say that, but, but the DOD doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sort of push forward on those a lot. Um, and so, so yeah. And, you know, okay, so I'm doing that sort of stuff and it's going to impact my readiness. It's not going to impact my readiness. I'm going to send the hospital ship. I'm going to send some amphibs. Those guys are pretty irrelevant uh, for the Taiwan, Taiwan problem. And they can easily be refragged out of the Philippines. If they're in the Philippines, they can easily be taken out of the Philippines and and, re, and retorked uh, for a for a combat operation. So I don't I don't think it's going to grind us down. Now, what will grind us down is the migration, uh, and the migration and the instability it generates, um, and the opportunities that generates for adversaries. Uh, kind of goes into the Cold War scenario where you're. You're talking a lot of instability. You're talking a lot of interference in other countries. Uh, you're talking about need for intervention. Uh, those kind of problems, they will stress the military. But remember, all the militaries will be stressed by that. It won't be just the U.S. military. Uh, and so that's going to be, again, somewhat proportional between the militaries. But yeah, I, I actually did include that in my game, in a, in a global game, uh, looking at that, 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 the increased instability and the, and the drag on uh on a military availability due to the need to intervene um, is, is going to be a significant problem. But, uh, but in terms of disaster management, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of instability and sort of this uh, uh, Cold War type of scenario where you have to intervene in different countries to try to stabilize them, I think that may be, a, that may be much a bigger play in the future. So. Well, thank you for that very detailed uh, response, Ed. Um, <laughs> I'll shut uh, up. No, <laughs> if, if anyone has any more questions, uh, you can save them for later because I think we'll be done now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop the recording.